eight years ago, uh, I was called into my editor's office at The Atlantic, and I was asked to write my first magazine story. And the editor of the magazine calls me in, and he shuts the door, and he says, I have this really cool idea for you. I think it'd be perfect for you to write for our summer issue about the biggest ideas of the year. And he said, Netflix is getting into the original content business. They're buying their first series of, uh, sh of television shows. I believe Lilyhammer was technically the first, but House of Cards, one of the most yeah. famous to debut here in the US. Um, I think this is gonna be huge. Derek, what do you think? And here is my huge opportunity to kickstart my print magazine career. <laughs> and I remember distinctly, I told my editor, eh. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know if this whole thing is going to work. I don't know if it's going to work out. I, I don't know if they're going to keep buying stuff. I mean, it's so expensive, $100 million, like just for House of Cards. There, there, there's no way this sort of trend continues. Um, that was catastrophically wrong. Uh, <laughs> journalism, they say, is a, a first draft of history. Um, those who get the first draft wrong are typically not lucky enough to be able to co-produce a second draft of history, which may be more accurate. So I, I see this as my opportunity um, to co-produce just that, a, a second draft <laughs> of the history and the future of Netflix, which is, of course, a history and future um, of uh, video entertainment itself. Ted, um, I shared a little bit of embarrassing uh, details from my past. Um, can you tell us a little bit about uh, how you went from college and an Arizona video store to being the co-founder of Netflix? Uh, not the co-founder, but I will tell you, the, I was uh, going to school, working in a video store to pay for it, uh, and I was sure, I, oddly, that I was going to be a journalist from the time I was about 10 years old. And I was uh, edit editing the college newspaper, and my part-time job was working in this video store. And I had an epiphany at some point when I was going to move on from community college to university was uh, that I wasn't a very good writer. And so the chances that I was going to be a journalist without the ability to write well uh, was not very good. And I really didn't have a plan B. And I was telling the guy who owned the chain of video stores I worked at uh, my dilemma, which was, I don't really think I'm going to be good at this. And this is the only thing I've ever really thought I would be doing. And uh, he said, well, what? And the time that I was working for him in that couple of years, um, he and his wife had a few kids. and. Uh, he had grown the store from the chain from one store to nine stores in a few years, and he was never home. And he said, "Look, I, I need to take some time off and be home with my family, or my wife's gonna this is gonna be short lived." Uh, and I was gonna, "How about while you figure it out?" He just turned over the the chain to me to run. This literally just kind of you know like gave me the big keys, you know. Uh, and so basically, with a very low, it felt pretty low stakes in terms of the risk, but um, I found myself. Um, in the middle of what turned out to be a combination of film school and business school, uh, running a store without a net, uh, running a chain of stores without a net, and, and watching everything in, ever produced and put on video. Uh, because video stores were famously empty all day, <laughs> because they did all their business the last couple hours of the day. Um, so I could really, I literally made it a point just to dig into Fellini films and uh, Carousel you gave and yourself a master in yeah, the history yeah. of video, yeah. Uh, and it turned out to be this funny thing, which is that when you start seeing these things, you start seeing patterns. And, mm -hmm. uh, and then I started, when people would come in to check movies out, and they'd say, oh, I love this movie. I'd go, oh, you love that movie. You're going to love this one. And, and it just became a part of the ongoing thing. And I never did finish my education. Uh, and I didn't, uh, um, and I went from doing, work, running these chain of video stores to video distribution. Uh, and then I have to re brief window back to retail when I met Reed Hastings in 1989. Um, uh, 1999, I get this call. I was working at a for a chain of stores that um, I, I negotiated the first of its kind uh, revenue share deal on DVD with a couple of the studios. It got into the, the trade press. And Reed Hastings, who founded Netflix, um, uh, saw the article and just said, oh, like, Reed knew everything. He's a great engineer, and he didn't really know much about the video, the movie business. Mm -hmm. So he needed somebody to help out with that part of the business. And, kind of summons me to come up to Silicon Valley. My very first e-commerce transaction was to buy that plane ticket. Uh, and um, and I, we had a meeting in a strip center uh, in, in Los Gatos. Um, and we, at the, in this conversation, I thought I'd either met uh, the, the greatest visionary I've ever seen or a crazy person. And I wasn't smart enough to know the difference at the time. Uh, but we basically, he described Netflix almost exactly like it is right now in 1999. Hmm. 
And the internet was so slow and so expensive at that time, it was so abstract that that could possibly be, po be, be true. Um, but he said it with such conviction mm -hmm. and such clarity. And I remember he was explaining Moore's Law to me. I said, well, because I, I said, I, I, I don't think, because he said his big bold statement was, all filmed entertainment is going to come into everyone's homes on the internet. Mm -hmm. And I said, I, someone just emailed me a South Park clip. It took seven days to open. I don't think that's possible. <laughs> and he said, no, no, the internet's going to get twice as fast. It'd have to price every 18 months. It's called Moore's Law. And I just nodded like I knew what I was talking about. Oh, Moore's Law, of course. <laughs> And, uh, and I went home and I remember thinking, I wasn't sure, honestly, today, I can tell you if I actually believed him at the time, but I do believe that no one probably ever did a life-changing or world-changing thing without telling somebody first. And I thought maybe he just told me, you know? <laughs> Uh, one small detail of that that I love is the fact that when you were working at the video store, you spent, you, you, you knew so much about the inventory that when people came in and said, you know, I like uh, Annie Hall, what should I watch next? Yeah. You could give them recommendations. Yeah. So you were the original human algorithm for recommendations. It's <laughs> 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 Tedflix. Yeah. They basically well, found yeah, a way somebody, to digitize it, your mind. It's yeah. like the fun thing would be like if somebody, you, you, if you did stumble into somebody in Phoenix, Arizona who liked a Woody Allen movie, uh, they would <laughs> 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 they, they would also like an Albert Brooks movie, and they never heard of Albert Brooks, you know, so you were able to make those kind of connections. And I had a lot, entertained myself doing it. But. Right. So for the longest time, Netflix was, a, a, you guys were a distribution company. Yes. You took video, you took movies and television shows that existed, and when you were a DVD business, you sent DVDs to people's homes, right. and when you became a streaming business, you streamed right. content owned by other people to people's homes. And you transitioned from a dis distribution business to a content and distribution business. And what I find so interesting about that transition that I'd love you to talk about a little bit is that when you're in the distribution business, you know exactly what you've got with your content. Yeah. You know when you're sending someone a video of Citizen Kane, what Citizen Kane was and whether people tend to like it. You know when you buy the rights to Cheers. Did people like Cheers? Yes, they did. So you know that it's popular. When you're in the content business, you have no clue what you're making. Yeah. You have no idea. You are approving. I mean, the director doesn't know, the actors don't know, the writers don't know how, it's, how good it's going to be. So what was that transition like? What were some of the growing pains shifting from a distribution company to a company that's getting into the business of buying content that doesn't even exist yet? Well, it has to be that when you look at those, basically spend my entire career, even going back to those, those days at the video stores and even and my team at Netflix, trying to figure out what all this stuff, what everything, what all those things that you just listed up, what do they mean? And do they mean anything in, to anything else? So when, when your, your love of Cheers, does it really tell me about your desire to see other things? And what, it, what makes Cheers like other things? And so trying to figure out all those kind of things is really important on the distribution side. Because you are trying to figure out, you're, trying to, you're, you're, um, you're gathering and capturing demand. Right. You're not creating demand. Right. You're studying yeah. taste. Right, the, demands were already the demand was already created. Yeah. So here you're trying, but it went now in the new part of what we do today, uh, you know, starting with Lily Hammer and House of Cards and Orange is the New Black, it is now we have a brand that we have to create demand for. Mm. And we have to figure out how to make, push this thing out into the zeitgeist and something that people care about. And it was kind of, it was funny, our first choice of, of House of Cards, the first deal was Lily Hammer and then the first show, or the first deal was House of Cards and the first show to hit was yeah. Lily Hammer. And um, they probably couldn't have been much different. But House of Cards was, I would say like the, a no-brainer. It's like every, HBO wanted it, FX wanted it, AMC wanted it, um, it had, um, Kevin Spacey, who was a big deal at the time, uh, <laughs> uh, Robin Wright, um, the three scripts by Bo Willimont that had been written were amazing. He was nominated for an Oscar that year for writing a, mo for writing a film. Uh, David Fincher was going to direct television for the first time. I think he's one of the greatest contemporary directors alive. So and felt, based on a really compelling uh, British, uh, incredible British show that I yeah. love, the British yeah, version of, of House of Cards. So it felt, you know, like it, would, it felt very low risk in that way, even though it was a lot of money and we'd never done it before. Um, but the big thing was we had to convince the talent, why do it with us? You know, so we famously now gave them 26 episodes with no pilot and a promise not to give them any notes uh, in the production. And, uh, but, but, but the reason I did that was because there was no reason they should have done it with us. We had never created an original or launched an original anything. So basically what I had to do is go to them and say, look, here's what's, here's what's gonna set us apart from everybody else. At that time, you were likely get a pilot order. You would, a, a direct to season order was, um, was pretty rare. And we went direct to two seasons. And so that was the way that I could kind of pull them over the finish line to try to do it with us. 
this is really interesting because it gets a little bit to the, to the future of content that, that we're going to get yeah. into in a second. But this attitude of light touch, yeah. I'd love you to tell us a little bit about whether it's still a philosophy of Netflix yeah. to be relatively light touch. Because that is something that would distinguish Netflix from, say, an HBO or some yeah. other media company that's famous for the executives giving the directors, the producers, the actors really strong notes when they see those initial yeah. cuts. Strong and lengthy notes. Yes. <laughs> uh, my, it's funny, but at the beginning, it was mostly out of necessity. We had no people. I didn't have a of, I didn't have no team to give notes. <laughs> and I told David Fincher, you don't want me giving you notes. You don't want me giving you notes. And he said, no, I might want some feedback. I go, I bet you don't. I bet you don't. Um, and, but I, but I, I knew enough people who were making shows for other people who had shared these horror stories. Mm -hmm. uh, there was one show that was on Cinemax that would get 80 pages of notes per episode. Good God. So thinking about it, that process and how they would go through it, and I knew that it made everybody crazy. Mm -hmm. And one thing that we had a, a really interesting corporate philosophy at Netflix around our business culture, uh, which was you know, trying to hire rock stars and give them the tools to do the best work of their life and get out of their way and empower them and look for the people who want to work in that environment, not with a lot of rules. And it works, it turns out it works really great in the creative process too. So I, the real art of what I do and what my team does is pick that show, pick that show runner, pick that writer, and then, let them, then give them the tools they need and let them get it done. But they're not, we're not gonna, I'm not gonna write a better episode of television than Bo Willimon, you know? So, and, and my, so this, the real art is just like any other executive hire is hire someone who's better at it than you are. Right. And then help and, and support the artist, don't make them crazy. Because a lot of those, in those notes that you're getting from the network, it's things like, that person shouldn't have a mustache. <laughs> why is that person wearing a blue shirt? That, you know, that, those kind of things, you know. Why is the couch facing east instead of west? And, and it's all those kind it's of- Extreme backseat driving. Extreme. Right. extreme. And, and, level. and it's a, there's layers and layers of executives who are petrified for their jobs, who basically want to va add value all the time, and they weigh that value by how much feedback they gave, whether it was useful or not, I think. And then some of it might be a healthy creative struggle. I mean, maybe, maybe artists need a foe, and the, the studio and the network becomes that foe that drives the artist. There's, some of that is true, but for the most part, what I find is no one, they don't want to fight. You know, they really want to make the best things that are possible, the best vision of the best version of what they came in to sell you. The other danger of, uh, of, of the corporate executives of the media company, the entertainment company, determining, you know, writing 80 pages for every single episode or 200 pages for every movie, is that the director's vision is not that which ultimately makes it into the movie. That right. the movies that are put out by the studio just end up being studio products. They're like, here, Correct. we have our set beats. If you gotta hit the beats, if you miss the beats, you're gonna get six pages about beat uh, two being missed. Um, another incredible and, and, and a really interesting inflection point that happened in 2011 wasn't just that you transferred from a distribution company to a content company, it's also that you transferred from a domestic company to an international company. Yeah. In 2011, I believe there were close to zero subscribers outside the United States, because, maybe some yeah. in Canada. Yeah. Five years later, half of your subscribers were international. Yeah. How did you, when did you decide that Netflix had to be a global company and how did you start to make that shift? Well, keep in mind, we were, a local, we were a domestic company, mostly because we were a DVD by mail company. So what I told you Reed described in 1999, it was global in his vision right away. The internet was global. So there was no reason that, we, that di distribution has to be fragmented, mm -hmm. be, except before, up, to the, up to the internet. Right. Because there's satellites, there's wire, there's cable, uh, there's, prints and there's prints that have to be moved around. There's all these physical things that make distribution fragmented. But the internet, there's no reason for it to be fragmented at all. The internet can serve the world simultaneously. So that's now the, now the ability to be global exists. The other one is, is you know, what the, um, the, the entertainment business has historically been half the US and the other half is the world. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and which kind of makes no sense since we're such a small part of the population. Uh, but it's just the way that it, you know, we, we have a big market that we got a jump start on producing for. The population was big enough, the market was big enough to produce well for, and the content traveled around. So instead of small countries investing in local production, they would take American shows and movies and dub them into local languages. And so it was a pretty, uh, entertainment business mostly homogenized, 50-50 domestic, but most companies that are, most internet companies, uh, global internet companies, uh, ex-China, uh, the U.S. is as small as 20% of their business. And where our bet was is that over time that 
the entertainment business would become similar in that way. How do you guys determine whether or not a show is successful? Um, what is it, how many people are watching it relative to what it costs? I mean, really, basically that... It's, relative, it's relatively old-fashioned. That's pretty old-fashioned in that yeah. way. And, but maybe different from motivation. Our motivation for it, though, is we feel like if we keep shows on that are really expensive that no one watches, uh, that creates an opportunity cost for the show that people would watch. Mm -hmm. So it's a, almost a double hit. Um, and that's not to say that shows have value. Some shows have value beyond their watching. Uh, brand halo and awards and all those things that make the brand really strong. But I don't think they're mutually exclusive. Our, our most popular shows are our most award-winning shows. Mm -hmm. So we don't have to say, well, you, ha you have to make tiny, hard-to-follow things that, to win an Oscar. Um, you can make you know, really great films that are also quite popular, and they will also be well-reviewed and, well and, and award-winning if they're great. It's interesting that your way of, of analyzing whether or not a show is successful is traditional, because the business model is not traditional. Yeah. The business model with television is you get a little bit of money from your affiliate fees, but a lot of that a lot of that is is being paid for with ads. So if more people are watching the show, then you get to pay for it with ads. It's, it's kind of worse than that over time. The reason why I think there's like television lost its equilibrium was um, it moved away from being a business. It's it's not a, a, a B to C business. Mm -hmm. It's a B to B business. So you if you're AMC, you have to make Comcast happy. You don't have to make the audience happy. Mm -hmm. And Comcast will pay you um, if they're happy for on whatever basis they're doing it. And the ratings matter only because you get the advertising, but that's less than half of the money to any of these networks. Right. Mostly it's those carriage fees. So there's not, they're, not that, they're not as interested as I am in keeping the audience happy. And I have to keep the audience happy because we have a one-click cancel. Mm -hmm. If you're not watching enough Netflix, if you're not enjoying what you're watching, you go on and click and you're done. So we, we're definitely There's no one on the phone in. to offer. We'll give it to you for $11, yeah. for $10, no, no, no. for $8. We'll bundle yeah. the phone. You yeah. click it and you're done. So we have a, you know, people can choose in and out of Netflix every day. So we really care about what the audience is watching and how they love it. A pet theory that I've had that I've always wanted to ask yeah. you about is that you know, because your business is subscribers, that your goal should be to maximize the number of subscribers, to constantly grow, yeah. which tells me, which should su suggest to me, that you would want to put your thumb on the scale of a show that adds the next marginal user. Yes. So for example, yeah. if you find that like, you're doing really, really well with all demographics, but for some reason, older Hispanics just aren't yep. subscribing to Netflix. That if someone comes to you with, say, two brilliant shows, you know, one's a brilliant show for like, that's like, for the incredible Kimmy Schmidt crowd, it's young, it's irreverent, and then another show is perfect yeah. for getting older Hispanics to sign up for Netflix, and you only have, you know, a X million dollars to buy one of those shows, that you would buy the show that would get you the next marginal subscriber base. Is, is there a thinking there that's strategic about, where do we fill in the gaps of subscribers that we don't yeah, yet have in our company? There, there's definitely a, a lot of art in the recipe, right? How much do you invest in growth versus how much do you invest in the base? So the, tr the challenge of that, obviously, is you have to, you're, up, you're also keeping the base happy, too. Mm -hmm. So we are always figuring out how to invest in new content verticals, is what we kind of call them, which is the idea of how do you serve an audience that we don't yet have. Grace and Frankie, I think, was our first big investment. Um, uh, companies that start on the Internet tend to be uh, young male, you know, at the beginning, uh, white, um, affluent. So a lot of those things, those characteristics. And as you get bigger, you get more mainstream. Uh, for us, like we did not have the Grace and Frankie audience when we bought Grace and Frankie. And so for us, the way that we can check that out, the way we, how we're measuring that is when somebody joins Netflix, the thing they watch in the first 24 hours is a real strong indicator as to why they joined. Oh, interesting. So you would put a little your thumb on the scale to your point for a show that has high first 24 hour watching. Um, and then you also look at things like if people who watch very little content value the things that they watch more than people who watch a lot of content who just kind of are killing time. Right. They have the TV on. So you watch the, the, low, the low usage customers watching is really valuable. So there's a, lot, there's a, a constant series of thumbs on the scale for, for the content. I did a podcast episode for The Atlantic. I do a podcast called Crazy Genius. And the last episode that we did in our third season was about Netflix. And it was a bit of a pro-con debate. We had a critic from New York Magazine, Matt Solar Seitz, who had some critical things to say about what Netflix was doing to American culture. And then we had Franklin Leonard, the founder of The Blacklist, which is this extremely influential list of unproduced screenplays that tends to ultimately bequeath a bunch of Oscar winners uh, by the end of the year, um, who defended a lot of what Netflix uh, was doing. And I want to give you what I consider the strongest arguments on both sides and have you react to it. So Matt Solar cites, and to a certain extent, this is a criticism that's shared by a lot of people in Brooklyn media. 
basically <laughs> said <laughs> that, um, you know, and I, I, he said to a certain extent, and this is, this is my attempt to channel him, um, Netflix is to blame for the algorithmic narcotizing of the American population. That it's giving us content that isn't good, that's just keeping us attached to our screens. And that we might previously have reached for art and reached for difficulty, but Netflix keeps us confined in these algorithmic niches where we just watch the same familiar thing followed by the same familiar thing until we're basically just zonked out on the couch watching, re -watch, watching rerun after rerun after rerun. <laughs> what do you say to that? I don't, that's an alternate universe. Um, in, first of all, the, the programming that we put on the air, um, the idea that they're somehow algorithmically created is foolishness. We don't write or create anything at Netflix, really. Our, the writers, the creators who come to us uh, do that. And, we're, and this, these are the shows that they would be making before in any other, for any other outlet. The, the one interesting thing that's kind of underappreciated is it's almost the opposite of this argument, so this is a good counter to it. What House of Cards did that was different than everything else up until that point was the show was written to be watched altogether. So everything on Netflix is, you know, had been all at once because it was a year after it was on TV. So when you do a network TV show, or uh, not just network, any premium, any show that's on once a week, that you lose 15 to 40% of the audience episode to episode. So if you're watching this show, it's possible that almost half the audience didn't see last week. So what they wind up doing in those shows is they wind up writing a bunch of exposition to remind the audience what happened last week. And, and sometimes they even do that between the commercial breaks, because they know they lose people. In the, some people just came in during the commercial. So they're going to tell you what happened Sweet, before the commercial. CSI, right. No, I mean, actually worked into the creative, into the, the, these unnatural stories. Mm -hmm. The way you, have, the, you and I are talking, and I said, oh, I'm, I'll be back tomorrow, because remember, <laughs> I got that right. job downtown, <laughs> so, <laughs> which we found out about last week. Right. So by the time you do all that, you actually lose storytelling time. So House of Cards was actually the first show written to be, to be binged. So it was the, the writers knew not only that there would be a 26 hour, because it was guaranteed, but they knew that the people who watched this episode definitely saw the one just before it. So they didn't, they didn't, do, they didn't have to do all that. And by the end of the season, you have 15 or 20 minutes per episode that you can add back into richer storytelling, character development, and all that kind of stuff. So it actually changed the structure of television writing pretty fundamentally yeah. in the opposite direction of what this person is making that argument. That's interesting. Yeah. Um, Frank and Leonard made the argument that um, you know, there were all of these uh, ancient assumptions about what worked and didn't work in Hollywood. There yeah. were assumptions that, for example, you know, movies with black leads wouldn't work overseas because people in Asia wouldn't want to watch a black cast, or that uh, superhero movies or, or thrillers that starred women wouldn't necessarily work in the U.S. And he said, Netflix, in a weird way, by simply following the data, by being unbiased by 20th century assumptions, and simply following, looking at the audience and seeing what they're watching, was able to overturn a lot of these ancient biases with their programming. You know, most famously, something like Orange is the New Black is not the kind of show that I think someone in, say, 1991 would expect to be an enormous hit on television. Right, right. But look at it. Um, to what extent, do you, how, how much do you relish Netflix overturning uh, conventional wisdoms in Hollywood? It, it's, my, it's my favorite part of the job, honestly. And I feel like it's one of, the, it's one of those things like what, what data would be useless, is useless for, is finding the next big thing because the, it's data is really good at figuring out what people are doing already based on the things that are already there and what they have to choose from. So all this conventional wisdom is based on this thing that failed once. Mm -hmm. And then somebody, one buyer who's still around, who talk, tells that horror story up to people. And mostly people, like I said, a lot of the, the entertainment culture is so fear-based. You know, people don't want to get fired. Mm -hmm. So the reason you don't, get, you, don't, don't, you don't get fired if you do things the way they've always been done and they don't work. Mm -hmm. yeah? <laughs> you get fired if you try something new and it doesn't work. They think you're nuts. So, when, and so we, we get the opportunity to keep, and remember, the, the nice thing about our entry into all this was, it's a, it's a, our, our environment's a lot more forgiving than it would be for a network. A network has three hours of prime time, five days a week, that's it. You better choose well, and that show better be great, and you better put it before and after the right show, or they're gonna fail. There's all those things that we don't have to deal with, and people look at Netflix, and the one thing is, is they watch the show for a minute, they, they, are, they fall into it, they love it. If they don't, they turn it off and watch something else, and they really are, so the stakes of any one of those shows 
is not as high as it is for everybody else, which gives us the opportunity to do something like a, a show um, out, of the, uh, out of the UK called uh, Sex Education. Right, um, which so is, that one too. Yeah, and, and, this, and the, uh, Lori Nunn, who is the, um, uh, the showrunner on the show, uh, is in her 20s, uh, had worked in a couple of writers' rooms, but never had run a, a television show ever. Yeah. Uh, and we can take a chance on people who are promising and, and stories that are different but promising. Uh, and you know who who really can pull it off, and you're gonna you get some nice nice surprises in there. Yeah. Journey toward the future. Um, earlier this month, a, a small niche entertainment company launched a streaming service. Its name escapes me. Um, oh, yeah. oh, that's right. Um, the writer, showrunners of reality have a sense of dramatic irony. So we are, of course, in the Walt Disney Family Museum. Um, the uh, Disney Plus. Uh, you know, signed up 10 million people in the first 24 hours. Um, it's obviously going to succeed on a certain basis in its own right. Um, you know, one thing when I, that I think of when I compare Netflix to Disney is that Netflix has this head start, but Disney has all this strong IP. They have Star Wars, and they have Pixar, and they have Marvel, and they have this enormous back catalog of animated classics. Um, do you think that Netflix needs more franchises to compete with Disney? I don't think so. I think franchises are just sequels. They're just second seasons, right? It's just not like that's the, there's any lock on having franchises. I think if anything, and, and I'm sure everything you just said is accurate. I think you know, Disney are great storytellers. They're, they've they run cruise ships, for crying out loud. They'll figure stuff out. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but I think about, like, uh, there's something about those franchises that are, um, a, I think, a blessing and a curse. I think that you're, you're trapped in a couple of, a couple of universes. Mm -hmm. And the, there is something quite freeing about not having IP gods that we're serving uh, and that we can create, a, you know, much more broadly across a lot of different storytellers. More polytheistic and, universe. Exactly. Yes. Versus, and, and I think when, and what happens is you get something, is Stranger Things a universe? Is Stranger Things a franchise? Yeah, it is, and it's spin, spin offable and uh, sell toysable. It's all those kind of things. Uh, but it, it, but in general, that isn't what drives the business. It's great storytelling that drives the business. So you look at these companies, and it's interesting. So half of Disney's profits come from amusement parks and merchandise. Um, it is, of course, a, a media company, but almost half of its profits come from cruise ships and uh, roller coasters and bed sheets. You look at HBO Max owned by AT&T, which is a phone company. Amazon Prime Video, another streaming competitor owned by an online retailer. Apple now has TV now. It's not in the media business, qua media business. It's in the business of selling hardware and software to go with the iPhones. Um, even Airbnb, I read today, is trying to get in the streaming business. Um, <laughs> in a weird way, when you put all this together, it makes Netflix seem like the odd man out, which is curious because you guys are the first, you're the OG disruptor of this business model. <laughs> and yet you're also the one company that at least I, I, of those that I named yeah. that has the simple business model of you watch TV, you give us your money, we buy more TV, that's it. Yeah. Is that simplicity a blessing or a curse? I think that's a huge blessing. M more than anything, it's because it enables us to move very fast. So all those things that you described going, not just being international, but having half of our subscribers being international in five years. Um, if we had international distribution deals in place with other networks or other theatrical distributors for our movies, we'd have to wait for them to unwind. We'd have to have this internal analysis around, well, we have to do better than this, and someone's going to say, put their bonus on the line that we can do better if not being international and just selling our stuff and all those things. And so it gives us the ability to say, we, have one, we really have one product. Netflix is a one product company, and we, that we focus every bit of our energy on making it great. The programming has to be great. It has to be delivered seamlessly. When you push play, it has to work. So no matter what, how great the content is, if you push play and it freezes up on you, if it doesn't remember where you were when you were watching it on your iPhone and then picked it up on the TV, all those kind of things, people don't, won't care as much how great the content is. And the reverse is true, too. You could have all this great tech, but if, there's, if the content's not great, they don't care about that either. So you have to do both. And our, our real advantage of beyond being a one product, one service company is that we've kind of always had our feet, you know, kind of one foot pl firmly planted in Silicon Valley, one foot firmly in Hollywood. And if you ask anyone who works for Netflix in LA, they think they work for the greatest entertainment company on the planet. And I, I think they're right. Um, and if you ask anyone who works here in Los Gatos, they think they work for the greatest tech company on the planet. And they're right too. Mm -hmm. 
and we don't really try to impose the corporate culture on one another, and we don't, there's, we don't, I don't subscribe to the idea that one is more important than the other. At the end of the day, the, 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 the members matter. The viewers have to love what they're watching, and that's part the UI, it's part functionality, and it's part, you know, tear-jerking storytelling. In the 1940s, the typical American bought 35 movie tickets a year. Today, the typical American buys 3.5 movie tickets a year. And there is no question that the streaming revolution, kicked off by Netflix, but joined by Disney and Apple, and et cetera, is likely going to accelerate this shift away from movie theaters as yeah. the totem of movie culture. The Irishman, this however- This audience gasped when you just said that. Yeah. I'm sorry? <laughs> they gasped when you said that. The, the statistic is, is striking. <laughs> and the, the graph is just, yeah. I mean, the, it's important but, to say that the graph yeah. of the decline makes it look like television, traditional television, that is broadcast and ca the cable bundle, is more responsible oh, yeah. for that decline than well, the streaming revolution. Well, movie Most attendance that, dropped every year since the, since the invention of television. That is correct, yeah. exactly. Yeah. Um, so don't just, it, with the don't just direct the gasp toward tech. <laughs> uh, direct the gasp, <laughs> angle the gasp toward uh, uh, Hollywood, the cable bundle. Um, the Irishman, however, uh, this extraordinary uh, Scorsese film that you guys are debuting, um, is going to have a short run in theaters. Yeah. I'm really interested, I'd love you to tell me about what your theory of the role of movie theaters is today. What are they for, for a company like Netflix? How many have seen The Irishman in the theaters? Wow. Oh, nice. Wow. Um, it is, uh, for us, there's a couple, it plays a couple of roles. One is that um, there's a, it's a, a bit generational, meaning the filmmakers themselves, when they were going to film school, when they were dreaming of their first film, uh, they dreamed of you seeing it like you're looking at us right now, mm -hmm. sitting in a group together in a dark room, watching on a big screen. That's how they dreamed of having their art be realized, even though it's mostly not true. Most people, even the folks who just raise their hands, watch most of their movies at home. Most of the movies they see in a year will watch it at home. But, but there's a romance to that, that we, uh, some of it is serving the romance that some of the audience has for that experience, and some of it is serving the romance that the filmmaker has for that experience, too. Hmm. Uh, there's a legitimizing effect to the movie being, you know, having been out. Um, there's a, um, there's a r rules about qualifying for the Academy Awards and those kind of things. So I want our filmmakers to be able to compete if they do the work of their life, uh, to be recognized by their peers, and some of, the, you know, some of those rules are still in place. Honestly, so, how much do you care about the Academy Awards? Uh, I care a lot that our filmmakers are eligible. To be honest with you, I, I, don't want my, I don't want our filmmakers to say, I don't want to make a film at Netflix that I can't win an Oscar, if they care about winning an Oscar. And remember, filmmakers get into this, part of that is that recognition uh, that they are seeking, that acceptance that they're seeking, and that award represents a lot to them. Yeah. So I don't want it to be a, a, a handicap to us getting great films. So that's why we invest in that. A couple of rapid fire questions. Um, does Netflix want to get into sports? No. Does Netflix want to get into news? No. Does Netflix want to get into amusement parks? On what time frame? <laughs> I'll give you 10 what, years. The great thing, interesting thing will be what is a, what is a theme park in 20 years? That's why I ask. That's because I think it's, it's interesting about the, you know, what, what role that VR experiences and things like that play in the future. Uh, versus do theme parks get bigger or do they get smaller and more local and more, more virtual? So, so I wouldn't rule out that at some point way down the road. Interesting. Yeah. I, can see, I can see how The Atlantic would write that article in 2029. Um, <laughs> first Netflix turned your living room into a movie theater, then Netflix yeah. turned your living room into a amusement yeah. park. <laughs> I should point out, by the way, that while well, you asked, it, I know this is a rapid fire and I'm breaking the rules. It's okay. But um, if you, uh, scripted drama gets time shifted uh, with the DVR or watched on demand, about 65% of the watching is done not live. Mm -hmm. Sports is 6% not live. So Netflix, one of our primary consumer promises is on demand. It's consumer control. We bring a lot of extra value to, on, to things that people want to have control over. And that meaning I don't think they value time shifting sports because it's so wrapped up in knowing what, um, uh, what happened, who won. So once you know who won, it's not so fun. Um, two more rapid, or at least rapid-ish, fire questions. Um, in five years, will 90% of Netflix's business be subscriber revenue? Um, I'm, going to, would, I'm going to say yes, but who knows? I'll be honest with you. I mean, five years is all, if you would have asked me a lot of questions about this business five years ago, 
I wouldn't have gotten mostly right. So, and last question, um, maybe not as serious, uh, but still, I think of great interest. In ten years, will ninety percent of Netflix's shows be dropped? Will the seasons be dropped all at once? I, I think the all becoming more interested in an episodic rollout. No, I mostly. I'm again going back to that consumer happiness thing. Uh, how many people have got into The Crown, the new season of The Crown? Say, how many people watched just one? <laughs> there you go. <laughs> My time constraint. I think what you find out is is that when we we do test, so there's, a, there's about 35, maybe 40 shows that premiere in the U.S. on a different net, on a network, and then premiere on Netflix everywhere else in the world. And those shows all run one a week because we want to get them close to the air date so people don't pirate them. So in that, if you look, when we look at the, the, the collective watching of a show that we put out all at once versus rolling it out one a week, the collective watching is higher. Many people are less likely to fall out when they're all together. Uh, and the social media buzz that people you know, talk about, the way they talk about the show, is higher in the all at once releases than it is in the week over week. So people, I think the reason why networks are so you know, hell bent on the one a week and why uh, Disney, when they just launched uh, their Mandalorians one a week, they don't have that much stuff. So they're stretching it out. So you have to come back next week because they, they don't have that much to watch. We have a lot to watch. And we just put it all out once. So you can watch it at your, pay, at your own pace. So to review the rapid fire round, we have no sports, no news, uh, living room <laughs> VR amusement parks uh, that will stretch the definition of the term. Um, and 90% uh, bingeable, more than 90% bingeable content. Um, everyone, please thank uh, Ted Sarandos. <laughs> and fortunately, Bandersnatch style, we can make this interactive. Yes. Um, we can uh, take questions from the audience, and we will start right here with this gentleman. How are you? Speak out if you, um, I can repeat it back, but um, as loud as possible. I'm, I'm out here, Sammy. Uh, my question for you is, I understand that Netflix is a business, and the first thing is you have to make money. But being an Aspen fellow and talking about the good society, there are other aspects to the business. Uh, and my question has several sides. Uh, what happened three years ago at Cannes with Omar Dovar, talking about cinema and the department, which I understand I, I don't agree right. with him. He, he apologized. But the thing is, Netflix, the way it's doing business, it's making it difficult for cinema as an art to live. Uh, a very good example is the Criterion Collection. I was talking to Peter Becker, and he was very worried about the new streaming services coming up, like uh, Disney. I said, when we have all this, people are not going to pay for, for Criterion. We're going to go out of business. So that's one side of it. The other side of it is the value system. The, what happened with Hassan Minaj and the episode that was removed with Saudi Arabia <coughs> and the interviews that Peter Hays uh, that, um, uh, Hays uh, had. Yeah. Right. So what is the value part, either the artistic part or the, yeah. or the, uh, the society part? So I'll, I'll take them. There's a lot to repeat there, but did anyone hear oh, no, the question? I, I, I'm, the I'm assuming that it was uh, projected okay. to the back. Um, I don't know, I'll take them in some reverse order, maybe. Um, the episode, uh, Hassan's show, uh, A Patriot Act, uh, I'm a hu we're huge fans. I think Hassan is brilliant. He, um, that show existed. That story was told. It was on Netflix. Uh, we didn't censor him. We didn't block him from telling a very controversial story. Um, the story bumped up against the law, against the local law that we have to adhere to local laws uh, in the, every country that we operate, and that's why we took the episode down. That episode is still on our YouTube channel in Saudi Arabia. It had been seen hundreds of, th hundreds of thousands of our, maybe millions of our subscribers in the Middle East watched that show, and it exists in every other place in the world except for that one place where it's illegal. Um, so we, and, and uh, as all the topics that he covers on that show. Uh, including another episode of the season that's about MBS that's also still on the service. Uh, so it's not, it, we, we, I will support public, I will support, and this goes to the good society, uh, I support free expression. I think we do a lot better as a society by, by supporting free expression that we dis, even if we disagree with it. Um, and so a big part of that is allowing Hassan to make that show and not being afraid of that, that idea. Um, and we see it in things like um, uh, Queer Eye. 
There's a story that was just out recently about a, a woman in Brazil who hadn't talked to her gay daughter in 10 years um, and then watched the episodes of Queer Eye and completely changed her view about not just uh, about her daughter, her, her own daughter, and let alone her views on homosexuality, and has now has a healthy relationship again with her daughter. Um, there are stories that we have to, um, that we feel like we can have a very positive influence on culture by introducing the world to one another, by showing real life in, one, in, in, every, in every country in the world. I have a theory that the more you know people, the more you see how they live, and the more how you see how similar we all are, the less likely they want to kill each other. <laughs> And so I think that the idea of, being, of telling really interesting global stories from everywhere in the world to everywhere in the world. Some of our um, popular shows, you know, uh, we have a show called Casa de Papel from Spain that is uh, all in Spanish. I don't know if anyone has seen the show. Here we call it Money Heist. Uh, but it is, in most countries in the world, it's the most popular show on Netflix. Um, and, it is, and it's usually popular in the US too, where no one's used to watching international programming. So the idea of giving a platform to international voices and sp um, spreading kind of international ideas uh, is very important, much more so than censorship. And I think my experience with the Henry Crown Fellowship uh, um, gave me a, a, a greater appreciation for expression of ideas and thoughts. Thank you. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. Um, so a couple, if you kind of compare Netflix to, say, a traditional studio. Oh, could, uh, one more thing? I'm sorry. I don't want to come back. Because you asked about, 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 about uh, Aldobar. Um, the, we, what we are doing, and I, this is, it's going to be self-serving because that's what I'm here for. <laughs> we're not hurting cinema at all. We are saving cinema. Uh, there were, Martin Scorsese tried to make The Irishman for 13 years. A, a movie, amazing screenplay by Steve Zalian, Robert De Niro, Joe Pesci, Al Pacino, Scorsese, the greatest living director, making a movie in the world that he lives in. No studio would make it. The movie, Mar Marriage Story that we just came with, with uh, Noah Baumbach, uh, Adam Driver, Scarlett Johansson, uh, The Two Popes with uh, Anthony Hopkins and John Jonathan Price. These are not slam dunk box office favorites that are going to keep things going. These are the movies that no one is making. And we are making them and finding huge global audiences for them. And we're going to keep this art form of humans telling stories to each other alive. We're not hurting it in that way. And do you see yourself having, I'm not sure if it's a Kurosawa yes. Kurosawa, I, I, I want to be fair to other people. Having, having people those on Netflix. Pardon? Having Kurosawa, or Kurosawa films on Netflix. Yes, yeah. we absolutely, we'd love to. Criterion has got them locked up in other different ways. So this, that's complicated business, unfortunately, the classic film business, so. Sure. Oh, yeah. um, so sort of comparing like the old studios with the back lot to Netflix, where you're able to you know, produce a huge amount of movies and TV this year, like more than in really any other studio around the world, as far as I'm aware. And you produce the content in the local languages you know, uh, around the world, which There's is 130 also seasons of local shows this year. Of yeah, producing. The, the, the older studios are just not not doing, right? I was just curious at what you've learned about the, the making the actual production process. Like, yeah. I know you're such a data-focused company. Uh, I'm curious, like, what you've learned about how to make content more efficiently. Um, it's an interesting thing. We want to obviously try to make things more efficiently. We try to work on those. Hard, but it, the, the main one is we try to make it better. And if we can do that, the, it kind of supersedes the efficiency a little bit. Because the, the, what you save on, some, on something here and there, in a, in a giant hit, it doesn't make much of a difference. And in a huge failure, it definitely doesn't make a difference. So you really are just trying to make the best version of what you're out for. It is interesting, though, that can, depending on where you're shooting, in, in Italy, television is very influenced by cinema. And Italian cinema is famously slow <laughs> to c come together. Very exp it's very expensive because they take a lot of production days and the sets are very relaxed. It's a very different process. Uh, so it might take 13 to 15 days an episode to shoot an Italian show versus you know, eight, to, 8 to 10 days in most places. Uh, and really, but going into, these into a market and appreciating what it is that's happening first is most important. And then see if you can help by you know, by shortening the production schedules, by doing some, adding some efficiencies to the to the production cycle. Usually, it's days of shooting that matters. Um, and if you could do that by getting the same show in a fewer in fewer days, that's a good thing. And what we're finding is that that is different all over the world. I mean, there's a kind of run and gun television that happens in some places. Super guerrilla, very inexpensive, and we go in and produce more like film too, uh, with higher production standards. In some places, that's usually welcomed. Um, but you have to figure out like what are the tastes of the public. 
So sometimes you're in France as very great scripted drama television. Uh, India really doesn't. I mean, India has a lot of soap operas and a lot of political talk shows and those kind of things, but it's a big movie culture, but there is no Breaking Bad in India. Um, so what we're able to do is go in and kind of create this thing that's very new to the country, which is a kind of a cinema, cinema infused television. Uh, and that's, so it's very, very new. So we're not, um, we, we don't really have anyone ahead of us to, so we're really kind of pioneering and figuring out as we go. Please. Thank you. I'm curious to know, um, actually two questions. What are some of your all time favorite movies and what are some of the, the hidden gems on Netflix that none of us have heard of? <laughs> Um, my, my, I have a, a fluid top five that move around a lot, but like I, I love The Godfather. I love uh, Lost in America. Um, I love Airplane. Yeah. Uh, so uh, <laughs> these are movies that I've seen over and over again, and, it, and they shift around a lot. And the classic cinema, you know, I, I, uh, I'm like everyone else on the, on the planet, Citizen Kane. It's pretty tough to beat. Um, Hidden Gems. There's one show that. Uh, you'll know, you'll learn my taste here because no, I'm the only one who loves this show anywhere in the world. I think it was a show that we had to ca unfortunately cancel called Lady Dynamite. Uh, that's one of the shows that I I wish people would appreciate as much as I do. <laughs> I'm gonna go on this side of the room, right over there. Um, how do you decide which shows are DVD only and which shows are streamed? Um, so the DVD only business is honestly a tiny sidebar of the business now. We still have a few million people that take the DVDs in the mail. Uh, and it's basically they get everything they can get on DVD. Um, so they're, they're, they're not curated at all. They're just mostly getting what they get, We're getting what's available. Uh, and then on streaming, it's all individually licensed for time for Windows. And then we create original programming. Uh, but for example, leading up to the Oscars, almost everything that's nominated for an Oscar is DVD only. Very few streaming shows. Uh, well, last year we had Roma. It was uh, right, right. nominated for ten. But most of the rest were DVD only. So I just I'm not, I'm not following the DVD only part. I'm sorry. Uh, in other words, if you wanted to see on Netflix. Netflix, on Netflix, yes, correct. Uh, we don't own the rights to uh, those other films. The studios do, and those films, those rights are then sold to HBO and Showtime and Stars and those folks. So. If we have multiple movies that are nominated, they'll all be on Netflix to stream. But on the DVD service, we're just buying other people's stuff on DVD. Yeah. yeah. So it's not a decision, it's because it's other people's stuff. Correct. Okay. Correct. Go to the back. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Uh, and Mr. Smith goes to Washington. Mm -hmm. James Stewart. That would have made the list, too. I should have thought of that. <laughs> James Stewart croaks, um, lost causes are the only causes worth fighting for. Um, do you have Lost Causes Netflix commercially unsuccessful programming? A lady you thought, <laughs> <laughs> And perhaps still are? Uh, I'm sorry, I, I talked over the last part of your question, sorry. Do you have uh, com unsuccessful yeah. commercial programming at Netflix that you thought, still think was worth and perhaps still is worth fighting for? I, I, think, it's, I think there are, like I said, there are some things that punch above their weight in terms of viewing relative to cost that you kind of wink and, go, and let go because of they either so they, they have a very important the problem that I run into is that the things if you, you're fighting for it because that is an important message if no one watches it the message didn't land and you didn't give someone else the microphone you know to tell that story so I do, I do think it's important that you don't kind of occupy the space with things that you might think are, are, are important but others don't enough to, to, to watch it because I think really what you do is you stifle the next voice that's coming along that might do a better job of telling that story or getting that point across. So I try not, there are some, there are some cause, lost causes that you just, that keep breaking through. Sir. Uh, yes, could you talk about your uh, relationship with the Obamas and the uh, documentaries that you're making like um, American, yeah, American Factory. Factory, yeah, which was amazing. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so the Obamas uh, formed a great production company called Higher Ground. Uh, their intent post-presidency is to um, tell great stories uh, uh, that kind of match the values of the, of, uh, that they had, but through entertainment, uh, both scripted, scripted and unscripted. Uh, and the first thing out will be America, was, is American Factory, which uh, if you have not seen it, it's a phenomenal documentary. Um, and we've got a, they, but they're doing things across the board, um, children's programming, uh, feature films as well. Nothing I could announce on their behalf yet. Uh, but we've, uh, they, we're doing an overall production deal with them so that they're producing original programming for us. So. 
Yes, ma'am. <coughs> yes, you. I am we, have, we have no other former presidents that do that. <laughs> <laughs> I'm an enormous fan of your international um, programming. I watch almost exclusively Korean and Chinese television. And I was introduced to it through, through Netflix, for which I'm very grateful. Um, but recently you've begun to produce your own Korean shows. Yes. And you keep stopping them halfway through. And I'm watching enough Korean shows now to know that they're, they're, they're dropped fully streamed from the beginning to the end. Right. Why do you cut it off after eight episodes and wait for another year and risk losing that audience? So they're probably they're not, not the ones that we're producing. Uh, are you talking, these are the soaps? Kingdom, that's the just. That was an eight episode season, though. But it's just, they're just seasons. They just stopped. Pardon? I think, he's saying, I think he's saying the season ended. Season, season two is coming. Season, <laughs> season, yes, but Korea doesn't do seasons. Korea does total shows. Yeah, so they, they do super series. They're like 56. Yeah, yeah this is not um, uh, what we're doing. This is what I was talking about in India a little bit, which is that this kingdom, as you can see, the production value of the show uh, is more like a film than it is, for, than it is on a television show. Uh -huh. uh, and the production cost of the film is much more like closer to uh, cinema than it is to TV. So those are, but those were designed to be eight in eight episode seasons that'll come out eight to eight months apart, but not not Korean Korean storytelling, but not necessarily in that delivery model. It, it and we we'll do and we'll do some of those as well. That was what was so interesting to me was the delivery model was much more more like Grace and Frankie than it was like Korean te television. Yeah, shows. and and our um, uh, those those shows by the way travel around the world yes. and they're and they and they tend to be cut up in different ways around the world. So what we're trying to do is make uh, pack a little more into those eight episodes than into doing kind of low bar, low cost fifty six hours. And by the way, if anybody's looking for a secret show on Netflix, Kingdom, <laughs> Kingdom is stunning. Kingdom is phenomenal. Yeah. Actually, that, that, that raises a question that I'd love to to but, just um, take briefly away from the audience. Um, uh, it's interesting to think that there are specific expectations in countries about how television programming should be told. That sometimes there's a, maybe there's a Korean strategy that says the, the story has to end. We're not ready for seasons. We want the entire story to be finished. It should be like a novel, and the novel is closed, and you're done. Um, there's the sort of British expectation yeah. that shows should be shorter. The Office was only a handful of episodes. The House of Cards uh, British miniseries was, I believe, three episodes. Three hours, maybe four. Yeah. yeah, three hours yeah. long. Um, do you ever find, is there ever resistance to Netflix being a, you know, Hollywood, San Francisco production, over aggressively enforcing American style television packaging on cultures that are used to their own yeah, thing? Yeah, it's not by our design most of the time. The, most of the, these are by showrunners, so the, the local showrunner. We let them lead. We let them lead on okay. it. And they wanted to make, in the case of the kingdom, they wanted to make a American style, American delivery style television show, but, in, but, it, but true to Korean storytelling. So that, we de definitely, they definitely lead. I think there's an interesting thing that I think that develops over time with television. It might be the, the, what happens in SVOD uh, to the world, to television, is every time you do a show and you love it. Like right now, I like success, HBO. I'm a big fan of Succession. Um, I was a huge fan of Barry, season one of Barry. Um, I loved it. I, I would say I loved that show. I thought the last episode of the first season was the perfect ending to a TV show. It should have been the last episode ever. And I have not seen it since season two of Barry. And I loved it. So it's like it's very, and what happens over time is every time you make a show now, you're not just competing with what else is on Wednesday night at 8 o'clock. You're competing with everything ever made. <laughs> and every year, the new season comes out, and you're repeating with everything ever made, plus the 500 things that came out this year. So the bar keeps getting raised on, even shows you love, the fact that you're going to, will you get back to them? And every once in a while, a show like The Crown is bigger in season three than it was in season one. Ozark is bigger in season two than season one. But for the most part, it's really hard to get the audience back, even a loving audience. So that, that is a change, I think, in television, which is, may, I, I think an evolution, a natural evolution, might be that it becomes more like British television. Mm -hmm. And what I really encourage uh, when people come in to pitch to us is tell this show to make this film in exactly the running time you need. If it's five hours and done, that's five hours and done. Uh, um, there's a, did anyone see Godless? We had a, a miniseries called Godless, a great Western miniseries. Okay, it came in to Netflix as a feature film. And our, our team that read the film said, oh, this is a great script, but there's like 50 stories that don't, that don't go in, that, that are missing. 
Like, I want to know more about this town. I want to know about more about these women. And he said, oh, great. I cut 150 pages out of the script. <laughs> so I said, well, and they went, took it back out for six months and came back. And it was a six, and we did it as a six-hour mini. So I, it, I want the stories to organically be as long or short as they need to be or should be. Sir. If you fast forward out a number of years with all the new entrants in streaming video, you're competing for a share of wallet and share of time. At the same time, content is getting to be more expensive for you to purchase. Who are the winners and how did the economics shake out over time? You guys. The fans are the winners. Because I, I think right, in, television has never been a greater value. Um, I think in terms of time spent, in terms of quality of the time spent, uh, and the kind of relative value proposition. Um, so I think the, the winners in general, it's gonna, if it, it has to start with the viewers and the consumers have to win first. Uh, and then people who figure that out the best, which is still gonna be to, to, to be determined over the next decades, uh, will also will be, the, will be the, the business winners in that. And one incredible statistic that I just saw, if you add up the amount of money that the top nine entertainment companies are gonna spend on content in 2020, if Netflix and Disney, what it's spending on both uh, original programming and on sports rights, you know, you add in Time Warner all the way down to Discovery, it's a hundred billion dollars. One hundred billion dollars on entertainment in 2020. No one can say what the landscape is necessarily going to look like in 2030, but you know, who's the winner in 2020? It's the people who are having a hundred billion dollars spent what, on behalf of. Yeah, that's right, it's us yeah. in this room. It's you, sir. It's yeah. It's it's. It's everyone. Yes. So you mentioned your unconventional education and <laughs> learning by doing, and that made all the difference. With all the creators that you see and who pitch to you and all the content <clears throat> you discover, I, what is your advice for future storytellers? I have a 17-year-old who wants to be a filmmaker. Is it film school? Or where, what, what, do you, what do you think? You know, film, I find that my son is a senior at Chapman University in California. He was a, wants to be a film editor. Like my, except for, he's similar to me, like he's known he's wanted to be an editor since he was 12, except for he's really good. <laughs> so he probably will be. Um, but film schools are evolving so fast that Chapman, they put a camera in their hands the first day. And I go, you know, everywhere else I've looked at, everywhere I speak at a lot of co colleges around the world, and they mostly, uh, you don't get to start shooting for a year or two. Um, they are shooting the first day at Chapman. Um, they're, they're at USC, they still teach a, school, a class on writing a pilot. I don't think there's going to be people writing, pi producing pilots very much. So the idea is, I think that yes, but but I do think that the film school experience, the fellowship, the network that's created, and all those kind of things is really valuable. Um, it's it's certainly. I mean, I, I I hate my situation with my with my own kids because I they're trying to tell them how important school is when I dropped out of community college two years <laughs> in. But they you did, you did okay. Uh, as a, but I'm just been tremendously lucky, and also that I st I'm stuck in the same business for my entire adult life. Uh, where this, What I missed out on was the opportunity and the network ship and the fellowship and all that stuff that, ca that comes with it that I get to see my, my kids experience. So. Yes. Okay, this is a question from the Aspen Institute. An Aspen, Aspen Institute person. Um, and people have talked about this in different ways. You own a lot of our time. And your voice, however it's expressed, becomes increasingly important um, because we're watching you and we're not watching, let's say, MSNBC. We're not watching CNN or we're not reading the San Francisco Chronicle or the New York Times or like, the Atlantic. <laughs> you are really <laughs> designed Atlantic, which I cannot speak more highly of. And Derek, by the way, is incredible. Right. Um, do you think, given all the things that we're up against as a society, that there is a role for streaming services such as yours to accept, and I'm thinking of the Obama model here, storytelling that's really going to address the critical issues of the day and, and give it some prominence. And, and for us to communicate in a post-fact world, real issues based on facts, that we're going to have to do that through entertainment and get people's attention that way? Or how do we, how do we build a more informed society? So I, one of the things that um, I'm most proud of, I feel like when I, someday, if I ever look back on all this and write a book or something, uh, the first thing to me is that I grew up in, I mentioned in Phoenix, one art house theater, 
an hour and a half bus ride away. So if you wanted to see something slightly out of the mainstream, you'd have to, I'd have to get on the bus. And I, do, I used to do it all the time as a young man. And, I, uh, and if I, I, what I mostly did is go, went to see documentaries. And if not for that Valley Art Theater in Tempe, Arizona, documentary didn't exist in my world. And I learned more about life and the world from those documentaries than I could have possibly in a lifetime of travel. And I think that documentaries, you know, tends to be the kind of the, the scorekeeper, you know, of society. <coughs> and and what I'm very mostly proud of, not just that we produce and make a lot of documentaries, uh, but that we get a, a big audience for them, big mainstream watching, uh, that we get into the discussion around things like uh, the impact that the, our documentary Thirteenth had on, uh, on on incarceration in the U.S. Mm -hmm. and the history of uh, injustice that happens. Um, uh, or it could be something that's something like Winter on Fire, talking about we're a little ahead of the curve on the Ukraine story and the, and the Soviet influence on the Ukraine and all these things. So I do think that there are um, roles that we play that, in, that enable a, an, audi an audience to see the story. It's not enough, I think, that pe people, everybody has a Twitter and everybody can put information into the world. You have to be able to aggravate, aggregate a story and aggregate facts and be able to put it in front of the public in a way that they'll see it. And then we can help rise the, you know, the fact that you asked about the Oscars, why I really, what I really care about is that doc, those documentary films getting, because I see what happens when one of them gets nominated or wins the Oscar. That plunges the film into the zeitgeist in a way that really matters. So um, those are the things that we are, you know, using. At the end of the day, we're an entertainment company, and we are entertaining. And that is, plays a very important role in our culture. Uh, you know, take, giving you something to watch besides MSNBC and CNN. Uh, and Fox uh, is something important too. So. We have one more question. You got it, sir. Um, I'll try to make it brief. I've actually been a cog on your sets because I'm actually in the industry, so uh, it's been what interesting. You work at? Uh, I was on the OA, oh, cool. uh, so running around in downtown and all that. But yeah. I'll try to keep it brief. Basically, it's really exciting. Hateful Eight has now an option where it's divided into, I think, eight or six parts. It's a director's vision. Um, yeah. So two things. One is, it's really exciting to provide directors an option to show an unfiltered view of their film. Do you think you're going to expand on that? <coughs> Number two, I, I know that you're probably keeping things secret, but is there anything that you can tell us you're really excited about taking your company forward that we can look forward to, or things that we may not expect? Um, I could well, so the, like, I mean, one that we're kind of in the middle of, someone asked me earlier about um, that it feels like the movies have become more important. And it just it has taken us about three years to get them to where we're at today. So the films that we're doing, the scale of the films that we're doing, um, I think are a magnitude bigger and better than they, than they were. And I think that's going to continue to expand. Um, on the director's vision, um, it's funny if you look at it, the Netflix films, like the, the Coen Brothers movies they made for us, or, or Marty's movie, The Irishman. And if you ask them, do you want to do a director's cut? They say, this is the director's cut. Because there, there, there was none of that. But being able to go backwards, Quentin, Quentin does this on all of his films, and this really actually started on a discussion we were having about um, uh, Kill Bill. And he has a, a cut that takes Kill Bill 1 and 2 and puts it together with like 45 minutes of other footage that he didn't put in there that he's always wanted to do. And there's been some rights issues with it and those kind of things. So in the meantime, it got him thinking about and trying it with Hateful Eight, and he came to us and offered it up. So, but yeah, I'd love to see that people reconceptualize it. It's funny you see the difference of, um, the, I went to see the new cut of Apocalypse Now in the theater in LA about three months ago, four months ago. And Coppola got up and introduced that. I realized this is the third time he's made Apocalypse Now. <laughs> and if you think about it, like he, I asked, and I've asked other directors, you know, would they go back to their films? And they're like, no, I, that is the movie. That movie is what it is because of who I was when I was 30 years old. I, I don't want to go back and make the movie from my, my 50 year old perspective. It's a, different, it's a different movie. It's not just a different cut of it. It's a different movie. I wouldn't make that movie today. So that's a pretty interesting bit. You know, Cop Coppola keeps re revisiting it. It's, you know, the guy's pretty genius. So it's up to the individual, I'm sure. That's great. Yeah. Everyone, thank you so much. And please welcome me and thank you so much. And I just want to give another warm thank you to Diane for bringing extraordinary conversations to uh, the Bay Area. Uh, 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 uh,
And I just want to wish everyone a happy Thanksgiving. And remember, your favorite cousin will be Netflix. Um, so, um, but thank you, Ted, for coming up north, and Derek for flying across the country. And stay tuned. We have another program in February exploring trust in media. Brian Stelter from CNN, the GP correspondent, will be with us. Um, so please, if you're not on the mailing list, talk to me. And thank you. Thank you.